I've had a lot of people say, I, I'm either nice or I'm assertive. Well, you know what? I'm both. I'm nice so I can be assertive. Hello and welcome to 1% Better. I'm your host, Joe Ferraro. Thank you so much for listening. You can connect with me on Twitter at Ferraro on Air, but you're in the right place to get better. If you like learning, if you like optimizing your time, if you want more, this is the right place. Go ahead and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, share, and review. But today's guest is a superstar in one of my favorite areas, communication. Today's conversation is with Chris Voss. Chris is CEO of the Black Swan Group and author of the national bestseller, Never Split the Difference, Negotiating as if Your Life Depended on It. Will he help you get 1% better at negotiating? You better believe it. But it's so much more than that. Chris shares incredible stories from the front lines of hostage standoffs, reveals how he got GE CEO Jack Welch to visit his classroom, and even gets ridiculously practical, offering you tips on how to save thousands when you choose to remodel the next room in your house. Reach out to Chris on Twitter at Voss Negotiation, on Facebook at Chris Voss Negotiation, but most importantly, prepare to listen to this one more than once. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Voss. Joe, thank you very much, man. I love the philosophy. Just You don't have to get a lot better every day, just a little bit, and it'll add up. Amen. It's systematic, right? Day after day. And uh, today, we yeah. bring in an author, your businessman and author of the book, Never Split the Difference, Negotiating as if Your Life Depended on It. Um, what made you want to write this book? Uh, um, when I was really sure, which was several years ago, that, that hostage negotiation actually is just great for business negotiations. Um, and then uh, I wanted to make sure that we test drove it enough in the different business schools that I taught in and had people that we were coaching and teaching test drive it so that we had a kind of an A to Z systematic approach that was easy to absorb. And when we felt we had it, you know, a whole system, we did decide to do a book and put it out. Have you been happy with what, what the feedback has been so far? Oh, just blown away by the feedback. I mean, it's if you're trying to help people get better. I mean, if you go look at the reviews of the book on Amazon, everybody says, hey, I made a deal. I made 139% of my sales target six months into the year. I in, I asked one question and got 20% of my annual sales target in one transaction. I mean, I love hearing people talk about applying this stuff and making a huge difference in their lives. So yeah, I love the feedback. Very happy with it. Nice. Uh, we love the word feedback around here, but we also love application, right? That's a lot of what we want to yeah. do today is, is apply, give them things to apply. Number one, first and foremost, you have to buy the book. And how much do I love the book? Um, this is the kind of book I bought as a Christmas gift for a very dear friend. And usually when you buy a gift, you're like, if he reads it, he reads it. Well, my friend did not read the book yet. And it angers me, Chris. That's how good this <laughs> book is. You know, he didn't read the book yet. And you know what? And then because a lot of people don't know how books going to start out, I usually I usually say, look, just promise you'll read the first five pages. And uh, because yeah, some books like you know, uh, getting to yes, I mean it's like reading the encyclopedia. Put you to sleep. Yeah, yeah, you know what's funny about this book is that if the if the tactics didn't work, which I've seen them work in my own life, if they didn't work, it would be an entertaining book. When you add in the fact that it that these things work, that I've seen it, that I've seen it in my own life. Now you're dealing with something super, super powerful. So that, that's kudos to you, man. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, and the, the, inter, the aspect of how entertaining the book is, is really due to my, my co-author, Tal Roz, who is a business writer extraordinaire. I mean, if you find something that Tal Roz is, if Tal Roz wrote a greeting card, you should read it. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm new to his work, but I'm going to go out and pick up Never Eat Alone. But your, your book seems to be set up in three ways. Tell me if I'm missing anything here. To me, it's, it's stories from the front lines of, of hostage negotiations. Then we have the practical tactics that kind of help people communicate communicate more effectively. And a third, sometimes overlooked aspect of the book, which I love, is that philosophy on why negotiation is important and doesn't necessarily, well, doesn't at all deserve a negative connotation. Does that make sense? Does it seem like a fair representation of what you were trying to do? I think that's a great description. And, and, and particularly the last part, that negotiation doesn't deserve a negative connotation. A lot of people imagine 
that to be a great negotiator, you, you got to be Donald Trump. You got to shout at people. You got to intimidate people. And that is not the case. Well, I, I enjoyed the book so much that I, I actually typed out the final three pages. And uh, I know that's a strange thing to do, but if you're going to get better every day, sometimes you got to do things differently. And I, and I want to read the very last line of the book. Sometimes I find working backwards can, can do a great deal for the listener. Your last sentence in this book, Chris, says, every negotiation, every conversation, every moment of life is a series of small conflicts that, managed well, can rise to creative beauty. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, you know, um, conflict, I know it's a cliche, but conflict is, is not just an opportunity. You know, it's a gateway. And what you can do when you conflict is an is a indicator that you got to collaborate with somebody to solve a problem. And so you can collaborate and then just make cool stuff happen, make your life better. And really enjoy it. So, yeah, I, I think it's it's an opportunity to cr- create collaboratively great outcomes. So when you hear the word conflict, you're thinking of a positive connotation. Yeah, I got I have to re I have to re uh, translate it in my head because my initial reaction, like everybody else, you know, the, the amygdala of our brain, the caveman part of the brain c- conflict and my guard goes up and I have to remind myself that, it, you know, it's a gateway to something better. But yeah, I got I got to reinterpret it. Hmm. I went in looking for a book on negotiation and in many ways I found a book on listening. Yeah. You talk about active listening. Could you talk to me about defining active listening and kind of walk us through how Chris Voss understands that process? Well, you know, and, and it's also even proactive. I mean, it's it's engaged. It's um we hostage negotiators found that in back in the 1970s cuz that's when hostage negotiation started. That if we started borrowing stuff from psychologists, therapists, like we didn't care where it came from. We just care if it worked. I mean, you know, you're in the middle of somebody getting ready to blow somebody else's brains out. You're not, this is not experimentation time. We had to have stuff that worked. And we began to figure out as laymen how the brain worked in terms of emotional positive reactions, emotional negative reactions, and how we could sort of like guide someone and not have them fight us over it. So, now, just in the last probably 10 years, neuroscience can look in somebody's brain and watch the electrical impulses go, and it backs up the stuff that the hostage negotiators learned back in the 70s, the 1970s. And so we, all right, so if we see how the brain wire, is wired and it works, and it's really – psychology has almost fallen away as a soft science and been replaced with neuroscience. All right, so if I know how the brain is going to react – why can't I get in there and and actively engage and turn dials down and turn other, other dials up? If I know that it makes you feel good for me to say to you, it seems like it matters to you to actually help people out. Mm. Now, I know just in a little bit, the name of your podcast, the way that you did the introduction, and the whole design of this interview is that you actually genuinely care about helping people out. You can tell that. Uh, yeah. If if I listen for it, if I start to add this stuff up, it's a little bit like being an investigator. Mm. Um, I know when I say that to you, first of all, you're going to gauge my tone of voice to uh, to get a gut reaction as to whether or not I am uh, honest in saying that. And when you're satisfied that I'm honest in saying that, your brain will actually trigger the release of probably some dopamine and some, some serotonin, and you're going to feel better. And consequently, you're going to be more interested in what I have to say and in opportunities to collaborate. And that's what this, you know, proactive listening is all, is all about. I have an understanding of how you, I want to understand how you're wired as a human being, what matters to you. I want to, I want to understand how the brain works and I want to put the two of those together. And I can use my powers for evil too. Believe me. <laughs> you know, you, you can make no mistake. And uh, Adam Grant wrote a great piece called The Dark Side of Emotional Intelligence. And the only reason he wrote that is because this stuff is so powerful. Yeah, I've noticed uh, throughout your work, you do do a lot of reading. But what you just did there was you, you kind of beautifully explained the balance of the art and science, right? You have the art of the negotiation, but you don't forget right. about the science, do you? Right, right, right. And, th- and that's why, in reality, any negotiation book written before 2015 even, because we, we learned so much more about brain science in the last two to three years. 
um, it's it's outdated to some to some degree because they didn't have the information that we have today that says the brain this is how the brain works we can look at it we can watch it work and one of the techniques that you used just moments ago was labeling right just don't understand how I'm feeling don't just use empathy but label it it seems like you're feeling a certain way or it seems like fairness is important to you those type of labels you talk throughout the book um, that's a key component it seems like and another one is mirroring um, that seems like one of the bread and butter techniques can you explain what that is yeah, you know what, and I want to touch back on labels for a second, too, because the simplicity of that design really actually um, gets by a lot of people. Okay. Um, I didn't say is, what I'm hearing is, now the problem with uh, making an observation of a dynamic that way is I use the word I, which makes it very self-centered and focused, and it subtly sends a message to you that I'm more interested in my perception than I am in yours. That's what happens when you use the word I. The other thing, too, is that, you know, it seems like to start the sentence, I actually trigger a reaction in your brain. The design of that is to kind of ask you to contemplate what I've just said. If I ask you to think about it, the prefrontal cortex, the CEO of the brain, engages with the emotional aspects of the brain, the limbic system, and causes your brain to consider it before you answer me. And I'm doing that intentionally to show respect and appreciation, but also that helps me gently, helps us move together in a very specific direction. I can get, I can actually make you think about something without you realizing I'm making you think about it by simply saying, that seems like, Hmm. and then you think about it. So you can even, in a, in a basic human interaction, you can see that working in in terms of, it, it seems like this is frustrating you. It seems like, uh, this is a reaction different than what you expected. Right, right. Because then the other, you, want, you want to open the other side's eyes in a way that they don't feel cornered or forced to open their eyes. And, and they'll, they'll react like, they'll either say, yeah, that's it. Or, the, or they'll go like, no, you know, it's not really that. This is what it is. Which is then just a really honest, it's, it's unguarded information from the other person as to what they're actually thinking about which is what you got to have mm. to actually make an effective deal. Got it. Yeah, your, your book talks about the art of deal making, the science of deal making, and, you know, human conversation, human communication. It's also a book about communication. It's, it, it appears to me that, that the labeling one is one that comes across and is received very um, subtly, whereas the mirror, at least to my ear, is more direct. Would you agree with that? Uh, you know, it's direct. Um, but also it triggers a lot of, a lot of subconscious stuff. It's kind of like, it's kind of like a triple threat also. And I actually don't even ask people the question anymore. What do you mean by that? Um, when they said something I don't understand because I just mirror the three words or the one to three words Mm. and I get a much fuller answer. Um, one of the problems with asking a question, what do you mean by that is frequently, the person will re- repeat the answer with the exact same words. I mean, I'm even guilty of that. It's like an American overseas. We're going to say it again, only louder. <laughs> Assuming mm. that people can understand English if it's louder. Um, so when you marry someone, what you actually do is you, is you, they would, in, would unequivocally know that you got the words and you still don't get it. So if they want to repeat it with the same words, that ain't going to help. And so that's one of the reasons why they'll reward and expand. Okay. So something I wanted to ask you about later was, uh, you say a surprisingly high number of, uh, high percentage of negotiations hinge on something outside of dollars and cents. So instead of me saying, what do you mean by that? I could just say outside of dollars and cents. Exactly. Exactly right. And then, then I'd probably say, yeah, well, you know, it's the intangibles. It's, it's, uh, the terms that make the deal. And, I, you know, I learned this as a hostage negotiator because, you know, we had we had a great bargaining system. We call it the Ackerman system. We talk about it in the book. I could, but I, and which would pound the heck out of any international kidnapper who's actually a commodities trader. A procurement negotiator is the same cat as the international kidnapper. I can pound the hell out of them with the Ackerman system over price. I can get nearly any price I want. To me, that was, that was the warm up. Um, because I can agree to any price you want and I can make you getting that money. I can make that, I can make you bleed from the ears over the details, 
which is the non-monetary terms of any given deal. You know, they say the fine, you know, the large print gives, the fine print taketh away. You know, yeah. this is me understanding what goes into, what really goes into an agreement and I, and make or break it on, on the terms that not in the deal. And, and half the time, actually 80% of the time, the terms, the non-monetary terms are actually going to be more important to you deep down in your gut because it's going to, if you feel like you won, you, you're happy with that and a small amount of money. I could pay you a lot of money and make you feel like you lost over it or made you feel like they, I held a gun to your head and I forced you to take it. I can give you another, a number of examples where people have walked away from lucrative deals because they were forced into them. And you'll hate the deal. Even though you got a lot of money, if I make you feel bad about it, feel like you lost in some way, you might actually re- re- reject that money. And so that's why the non-monetary terms for the feelings around the deal are, are the make or break ideas. One thing I consistently hear from you, Chris, is confidence. You, you seem to have this ultra confidence about your business, but I've also heard you write, you know, you're just a regular guy. You don't consider yourself super talented. In that way, you become kind of my dream guest because in terms of improvement, uh, it, it kind of spits in the face of the idea of a natural born leader, a natural born negotiator. How do you uh, unpack the idea between, you know, what you were born with, a set of skills and what you've acquired? Uh, I, I think primarily I, I do think I'm strong in one trait. And I think that trait is openness. And you can actually test for it. And I, I was sitting on uh, an airplane with a Pittsburgh Pirates baseball scout about a year and a half ago. And he said that they test for that on minor league ball players because they want to know if they're coachable. Mm. You know, they, they kind of, a guy can have all the talent in the world. If he's not coachable or she, it's not going to do you any good. And um, I don't know whether I was born with that or like my father put all of us to work. I got three sisters. He expected us to go to work in his business for as far back as I can remember. And he'd hand us a task and say, figure it out. And treat us as if we were capable of figuring it out. So we thought, all right, well, dad thinks we can figure this out. We might as well give it a try. So I kind of grew up in an environment of a figure it out environment. And, and I think with that, um, it helped me become really good at not just coach, uh, not just negotiating, but coaching negotiation also. Yeah. That's, that's the thing that kind of attracted me to you as well, right? It's not just that you're a practitioner, but you're coaching others, a way to kind of grow yourself and actually scale yourself, if you will. But I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you then what what are the traits, two or three traits you can or ways you can find out if someone is coachable? Uh, well, it, it, crazy quick way, um, which I also got from Adam Grant because another book he wrote that I like a lot is called Originals. You know, and so how do you find an original? How do you know if you're an original? And he said, "What's your default? What's the internet browser on your on your computer?" Oh, on I your love phone? this. I love this. And and so I was like, ah, "All right." And he, and he said, if, if, if you, chances are, if your default, if you're the browser you use is other than your default browser, which means if you're using Google, if you're using Chrome or Firefox, cause that's not what comes with your device. If you got a, if you got a, uh, IBM based, a Mac, you know, a, a PC based device, it's going to come with Internet Explorer. If you got an Apple product, it's going to come with Safari. And, uh, and then I was like, Oh my God, because, what I had done at that time was I was using Chrome on my laptop, but I was still using Safari on my on my uh, on my iPhone. So I quick I quick switched as if nobody was looking. I had to switch <laughs> like Adam will if, never know. Yeah, 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 like he'll never know that I switched over my phone. But then he, he said because if you if you're using something other than the default, that means that you're taking the time to find out answers on your own instead of being funneled by the default. So I ran an experiment. I, um, uh, in my, the class I was teaching at USC at the time, MBA level, uh, evening part time students, which means they have full time jobs in a day, capable people making a world work for them. I just, I sent an email to all my students, uh, 54 of them, and said, What's your default? What browser are you using? And, and here's what I got back. Some of my A students still used the default browser. Some of them, some of them, a minority had not changed from what came with their machine. 
So that wasn't, it didn't, if you didn't change, it didn't necessarily mean you weren't capable of great things. But every single one of my poor students had the default browser. Every single one, not one of them was used taking the extra steps to figure stuff out. I found that really interesting. That is interesting. That's the kind of idea we want our listeners to take away. M- my version of that is, is similar. It's, it's if when you send a, a text message, it says sent from my iPhone. Because you can delete that each and every time or you can go to the default and find a way to get rid of it you know, for good. Not that it's not cool to be from an iPhone, but you don't need that every time you send an email. Yeah, and it's and it's an ad for for Apple that uh, it's free advertising they're getting that uh, they're not paying you for. Nice. I love getting into the weeds with the practicality, Chris. When I throw two, uh, three numbers at you, when I throw seven, thirty eight, fifty five, when I throw that at you, <laughs> what's what's that make you think of? Uh, you know, that's that's the magic and hotly disputed ratio of the weight of our words versus our tone of voice versus our body language. Yeah, it, it is. It seems to be disputed, but take take us on a little journey there. What what what's your perspective on those three numbers? Well, um, I know what it's from, and uh, the the numbers have been adapted from an original study by a UCL, uh, UCLA professor on on how we liked stuff. And but what I've seen is every single person who makes a living talking to people, Tony Robbins is one of those guys. He says 738.55 is right on, that your tone of voice is so much more important than what you say. It's five times more important than what you say. And your body language is even more important than that. So all the guys that are communicating in person, they see that number 738.55 from Tony Robbins to uh, another colleague of mine, Sheila Heen, who's co-author of a couple books. One of them is Difficult Conversations, which is a phenomenal book. She saw that it leaped out at her because she teaches people. She's a she's a lawyer. She's she's a lot of smart things. Those that communicate only in writing, whose written words is so important to them, they hate that ratio, and it offends them. And the only way it offends them is because they know deep down in their bones it's true. <laughs> <laughs> they want their words to weigh ninety percent. Instead of seven percent, because they make a living writing. Yeah, but they wouldn't. It wouldn't bother them so much if, if deep down in their gut, they didn't know that ratio was pretty accurate. Yeah, you spend so much time putting the written word together. I think the mind plays tricks on you, thinking, "Well, we've had time to calculate each word. We've put it down with so much thought. It should certainly carry more weight than than seven percent." How about the difference between those two magic words? You're right, and that's right. <laughs> Yeah, your right is the equivalent of F off, isn't it? <laughs> it? It means go away. It means, look, I still like you, um, but I really wish you would stop talking and just go away. <laughs> <laughs> and so many people are so, everybody says it to get somebody to shut up and leave them alone. It's, it's this great thing, and everybody loves hearing it. Like, and you know, even, even every now and then when I have to watch it, when somebody tells me, look at me and say, Chris, you're right. I'm like, yeah, I am. I, I, thank God you're so smart. And then I'm so happy that somebody said that to me that I shut up and I go away. <laughs> I get mm. suckered by it. But that's right is what people say when they believe that something is the indisputable truth that, you know, just the ch- change in a word in the beginning, you say that's right when you fully completely believe in what just been said. I mean, you, you embrace it so much. What, you know, as an example, whatever, whatever, whatever side of the political spectrum you're on, the last presidential debates leading up to the election, whether you were for Hillary, whether you were for Trump, when your candidate said something on TV in a debate, you didn't, you didn't jump up and point at the TV and say, you're right. You jumped up and you went, that's right. Mm. And that's what people say when they completely believe. And we get so seduced by your right. I had, um, I sat next to a dinner probably about a year ago, CEO of a company, read my book. They sent me next to this guy on purpose. I'd never met him before. He sat down and he says, he says, man, he says, you saved me so much trouble. I had a, a meeting with my senior executive team and I'd already read your book and I was laying out a strategy that I didn't think everybody got. And in the, in the middle of the conversation, one of my senior guys said, Tim, you're right. Mm. And if, and I said, and it, it, it was like a slap in the face because it made me realize I was so off track with all these guys 
that they would have to polite me at, politely ask me to shut up. And he said, so I stopped the meeting. I went back and I double checked on all my communication with everybody. And I went to each guy one at a time and I got us all on the same sheet of music. And if I didn't know the difference between that's right and you're right, I'd have thought that was a successful meeting and we'd have continued to go in the wrong direction for another couple of weeks before I tried to fix it again. Yeah, that, that makes so much sense. Um, you were right. I can see how that's the blow off. That's right. Is there, are there synonyms? Are there words that also sound like that? Just anecdotally in my life, and I don't know if it means that I'm not negotiating powerfully, I don't often hear those two words exactly as that. Yeah. What does that mean? Yeah. Um, there might be some watered down versions of it. You know, that's it exactly. Um, if, if you look around at, at different times when somebody, that's right is when somebody is really in, enthusiastically all in, which is, which can be a hard thing to get. Which is also why what makes it so valuable. That's right. To trigger that sort of a huge emotion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's in the same family as as you not being afraid uh, of hearing the word no. I wonder if you would tell the story of how you got Jack Welch, uh, world renowned leader, former CEO of GE, to come speak to your class. Uh, <laughs> my favorite moment because I thought I killed him when it happened. <laughs> I mean, I went to. Uh, you know, I went to a book signing. Jack Welch and his wife Susie signed a book, The Real Life MBA. You know, hundreds of people there. Long line, security line, and plus on top of the fact that, you know, they're trying to shuttle everybody through because, you know, it's a commodities interaction where it's a, um, a conveyor belt. You get signed and moved on because there's 200 people behind you. You know, Jack Welch is a legitimate celebrity. They, they don't know that I'm not a shareholder that lost my family fortune because I, sh I, I bet on GE at the wrong time. You know, they, they, this guy's on public. They're, you're going to get close to him. They don't know who you are. They haven't patted you down. There's actually a legitimate danger. So the time you come up to Jack Welch, you don't get to be there long. And uh, how many people asked Jack Welch to do something that day, right? I mean, how many people said, hey, you know, come over to the house, have dinner with the wife and kids, you know, you know, we come to my kid's birthday party, whatever kind of ridiculous notions. People are asking, trying to get Jack Welch to say yes time after time after time. So I walk up to this guy and I just look at him and I say, is it a ridiculous idea for you to come and speak at the negotiation course I teach at USC? And his face freezes <laughs> and he looks up and to the left and he just gets this ridiculously intense borderline furious look on his face, just like just up and to the left in the sky. And I'm like, Oh my God. And then he, when he doesn't move, I think I, I he's so angry. He just had a stroke and he's going to die. <laughs> and, I, and I get scared. I could just kill Jack. Well, <laughs> and, and, and then when he doesn't die and fall over in front of me, I'm still scared because he doesn't move and he looks furious. And I think he's going to start screaming for security to drag me out of there. And finally, after what seemed like an eternity, it was probably seven seconds, but, you know, seemed like forever. He looks back at me and he says, this is my personal assistant's name. This is a Twitter account we have set up to communicate with her. I'm going to call her and tell her that you'll be reaching out for her. I think we're going to be in Los Angeles in the fall if we are coming and speak to your class. And your face looked like what when he did that? I was like... Hey, this stuff works. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you create that exact line of dialogue in line, or did you know going in you were going to use that? I have I have practiced it enough that I can switch most of my yes questions to no questions and get the same result. With is it ridiculous? Is it a bad idea? Are you against? Have you given up on? Those are kind of the what did I do? Three or four precursors to just flip it. It takes some practice. It's uh, it's not quite as hard as learning to write with your left hand, but it may be, you know, it may be trying to write more neatly. So it takes a little bit of practice. But once you can do it, you can do it pretty quick. So you, you, two things I want to ask about there. One is practice. How do you practice these things in the field, in the real world? It's easier than most people think. And the reason it's easier than most people think is because it's so hard the first four tries. Mm. And, you know, rewind. so how do you practice, you know, uh, pick a skill and do it at lunch. Okay. Do it for an hour. 
ideally when you're at lunch, you're away from your desk, you're having conversations where you don't have skin in the game. And just the easiest one is mirror. Pick it. Monday is mirror day, mirror lunch day. Everybody that you talk to at lunch, repeat the last one or three words of what they said. You think the first two or three times you do that, people will scream at you and say, stop doing that. That's annoying me. Hmm. All right. So if it's lunch, it's a casual conversation. You say, oh, all right, I'm sorry. You know, I, I wasn't thinking. Now, that's not going to happen to you, but that's why the best way to practice these is in your, your no stakes conversations for an hour over breakfast, lunchtime, you know, go back to the regular way that you were um, talking to people when you go back to your desk. Now, what this does is the neuroscience tells us that this, the, the synaptic connections that fire together wire together, which is why initially it's, it's so hard because you haven't wired yourself to do that yet. But each and every time you practice it, the neurons fire together. They wire together a little more closely. Every subsequent time you do it is a little easier. By the time you've done it seven times, it's much easier. By the time you've done it 65 times, which is about a week's worth of practice, it's now in your DNA. Hmm. It's generally right about now for people who haven't read the book that begin to ask the question, is this manipulation? So how do, how do you answer that question? Negotiation versus manipulation. Yeah, well, it's a, uh, are you using your powers for good or not evil? It's only a tool. You know, everybody listening has got a cell phone. Everybody listening, do you know that, bad, that there are people out there that are using bad, that are using cell phones for bad ends? So it's not the tool, it's your intent and where you're going with it. Which is why Adam Grant wrote the book, uh, wrote the uh, piece called The Dark Side of Emotional Intelligence. It does have the potential for manipulation, which, number one, means you should at least be aware of it mm. so you can protect yourself. Number two, these skills, you know, tactical empathy, that's the preferred communication means of sociopaths, not because they're nice guys, but because they know it works. Now, if you want to choose to not use communication skills that are the best because bad guys are using them for bad ends, you know, that's your choice, but you should at least be aware of it so that you've got your guard up. Perfect. Perfect. So uh, another idea that you write about in the book that's a little counterintuitive, and, and again, why read a book if everything's intuitive, right? It's got to be counter, <laughs> right? You got to have something that's, that's counterintuitive, and you have a lot of it, Chris. And one of the things that I loved was the idea about going second in any negotiation. You often hear conventional wisdom say, go first. What I wanted to ask you about that was, do you suggest going second because you're a negotiation ninja and it's sharp for you and it's and it allows you to take advantage of people's um, weaknesses in negotiation? Or is that something you think everyone should do? Um, all right. So I'm not necessarily trying to take advantage of people's weaknesses. If, if the person on the other side is a negotiator who's really trying to pound me, you know, I'm happy to get into, you know, can you top this a battle with them, but I'm not trying to exploit weaknesses. I am trying to create as much opportunity as possible. And if you go first, I am now smarter in that moment. Mm -hmm. And you make a very good point because there's an awful lot of advice that says to go first, that it, that it sets a tone. Uh, and I, what I've found is everybody up to about a B plus player is going to find an advantage by going first because they need every edge they can get. They're only a B plus player. The A players, the majority of them, not all of them, but the majority of them want you to go first because it made them smarter. They got more information. They got a lot more information about your style and your intent. And they're not phased by a high anchor. It just doesn't impress them when you throw out a number that's outside the range. A lot of people, when you throw a number outside the range, they crumble inside. Uh, and those at high anchor are also those who crumble easily. What you're telling me, if, you have, if you're saying, I got to go first, you're telling me you can't withstand a punch in the nose, which is actually more information about you that I just gained as well. So... Um, if, if you can take a punch in the nose, you want the other side to punch first because you made it made you smarter and you just saw their best punch. 
Per perfect. And then we can marry a few of these ideas together as we get a little more, even more practical. If I gave you a real life scenario, people listening, they're, they're looking to remodel their bathroom. They're, they're looking to upgrade the kitchen. That, that to me is, is a pure opportunity for negotiation. Am I right? Right. Now, how do we go about that? How can you give some practical framework? And obviously the book walks them through this uh, um, amazingly. But what, what's the practical takeaways for people that are saying, all right, next month we've saved up. We're trying to, to, to do a, a big project either in the bathroom or the kitchen. And, and how do we begin this negotiation that our families are actually benefited because of these skills? Right. Well, so the, the first problem with any sort of a construction job is not the price, it's the implementation, which is all, like the case on a, almost every single deal. What happens when you hire a contractor? He wants a third down. He promises to start next week and he's gone for six months. Why is that? Because he took your third down and he went to, took that money and he went to finance the materials on the last job. And once he got the materials on the last job, he had to go do the last job. And he's not coming back to you till he's got somebody else's deposit. Almost, almost verbatim what happened to my friend. All right. So knowing that going in, you say to the contractor, well, look, I want to make this as quick and easy for you as possible. You give me a list. You say, what do you need the deposit for? And I say, I got to buy your materials. I say, like, awesome. I'm going to save you the trouble. You give me a list of the materials that you need to buy. I'll go buy them and I'll have them here for you. That will save you time and logistics. Now what happens is he doesn't get his money until he does your job. So you, you bought the materials, which has eliminated the need for the down payment. If First of all, if that's possible. Um, I, uh, and if it's not, what I do is I, is I give them less of a down payment. I, I, I will cut the down payment by at least half because so they got they got to come back to me. I've done it both ways. Uh, we put some windows in a house where um, it was all factory built stuff, and so we, I, you know, I just simply we we gave them less money. Now the the key to all this though is being nice about it. <laughs> you know, you got you had, some people. I've had a lot of people say I I'm either nice or I'm assertive. We well, you know what I'm both. I'm nice so I can be assertive so that they don't feel like they've been slapped in the face. So you eliminate the need for the down payment. You cut the down payment dramatically. I don't give them as much as they ask for up front because I'm not, I'm just trying to remove temptation. I mean, when the guy says this to me, he's not trying to cheat me, but I'm removing his temptation to cheat me by having these tough terms and being nice about it. And what we did with the windows, the guy said, you know, the guy's telling us, we're going to have the windows, uh, it's going to be three to six weeks. You know what, it's really going to be three weeks, but I tell people six weeks just in case. <laughs> and and we, we can't get that guy to waiver from, even though we've cut his down payment. So I say, okay, so here's the deal. So we agree in advance that if all windows in, aren't in by four weeks, because if he gives me a three to six week window, then I'm not allowed to call him until six weeks are up. And I don't want to. And I'm going to start looking at the calendar after week three. So I say we agree in advance that at the end of four weeks, if you haven't called me and told me that the windows are in, then I get to call you and you have to take that call and you have to listen while I chew you out and I curse you up and down. <laughs> you agree in advance because you're so sure it's going to be three weeks. I'm spotting you a week. And so what ended up, and the guy, how's it, you know, the guy can't, the guy can't say no to that because he's made all these big promises to me and I spotted him a week. And what he ended up doing was with three weeks, three weeks in, he called us and said, all of your windows except three are in here right now. I'm looking at them right now. But since I nicely asked for permission to chew them out later on and got him to agree to that, and I did it nicely. He's preempting it. He doesn't want to hear from me because this is an image that I put in his head. So then finally, the last thing that we did, and, and again, we're holding back money on these guys every step of the way, but we're being nice about it because we understand the temptations of their business and we're just trying to re remove the temptation so they don't go in the wrong direction. Mm. In this world, you get what you ask for. You just have to ask correctly. You write that on page 18, and, and what a beautiful demonstration of that. Um, I love that. As you kind of get into away from business but into personal communication with family members, do, do those type of negotiations sound and look different? 
You know, not really. It's just that we have, you know, this is all about appreciating the other side's point of view. And when we're with family members, we're most likely to have uh, bad memories over their point of view. And even though it's true, we don't want to agree to it. Oh, exactly. Go ahead. And, and that's, and that's what stops us from articulating their point of view because we just don't like it. Yeah. It's funny you say that right, right before our conversation, you know, just like you mentioned in the book, terrorists have mom. Well, podcast hosts have moms and, and Chris Voss has moms. And, and you say, um, I, I say, mom, what, what piece of negotiation advice would you want? What, what would you want to hear from a world class expert? She says, I, I would like to know how to negotiate the impossible, like, like getting your father to take a month off of work and head to Florida this winter. <laughs> and when she says that, is that impossible? Has she put limits in it? Like everyone listening has a scenario like that. They're trying to convince their partner of something that the partner supposedly doesn't want to do. How, how do you advise people in those matters? Well, the first, the first problem is you're trying to convince them of your point of view, which carries with it the implicit message, I'm right and you're wrong, which is not a great way to start out a conversation. <laughs> no, it, it and is. Then, and then secondly, if, and, and actually it's a way to, the best way to defeat yourself because one of our main our drivers is autonomy and you're taking away their autonomy by saying, I'm right, you're wrong. Even if you're right, they don't like it. And then secondly, when you dig into why somebody doesn't want to do something, you know, maybe what they're after is something that's even more important to you. Or maybe what they're after wants you to, to rethink things in, a, in another way. Maybe he doesn't want to go down to Florida because wherever you guys are is where his home is and he feels closer to his wife. And when they're in Florida, he feels more distant from, from your mom. Mm. You know, you don't, you don't know what, it, it, sometimes when you find out what's really driving somebody else, you change your mind, which is why, you know, I like to say never be so sure of what you want that you wouldn't take something better. Mm. And that has a lot to do with going second as well, because once they anchor, you, you, they may surprise you in the beginning. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you also reminded me of something that, you know, we've talked almost exclusively about the practical aspect of this. But one thing that can't be overlooked is just the years you've had in the field yourself and coaching others on these harrowing situations, right? Kidnapping, uh, hostages, terrible, horrifying things that you've managed to um, kind of stay cool under pressure. Uh, the story, the, the, there are stories throughout the book about some of these situations, but I wonder if there's one that you could share briefly um, that would illustrate the, the, the harrowing nature of your job and then how one of these techniques uh, saved the day. Yeah, we um, we had a kidnapping in the Philippines. Uh, the kidnapper was a serial killer, lone kidnapper, and the only one of his kind that that I know of that anybody ever ever dealt with. And if 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 I don't know about it, it it might have happened. But I know enough about this stuff that if I don't know about it, it probably didn't. We didn't know this guy was a one man operation at the time. Um, but he was so in love with plural pronouns because typically a kidnapping operation, they're business, which means you don't speak to the boss. You speak to his negotiator. This guy was so in love with the plural pronouns, which is exactly what business people do in business negotiations. You get somebody on the other side of the table who won't take responsibility for anything. He won't say, I mean, my is always we, they, them, us. You know, I got a board, I got a decision committee, I got all these people. This person's always referring to somebody that's not at the table. You were talking to the guy. And in this kidnapping, this guy was so in love with plural pronouns, I said, we got to be talking to the boss on the phone. I had no idea how right I was. I didn't know it was a one-man operation, which he was actively hiding, that he made each and every decision. And that's why he used the plural pronouns. But I said to myself, we got the boss on the phone here. This is a really good thing. We need to be gentle knowing this, but what, whatever we put into this negotiation, we got the guy on the other side. Now, I had coached uh, the brother of the victim was handling the negotiations, and I really, we really, he was a smart guy. He was very open, and, and he really got what we used to call open-ended questions. We now call them calibrated questions, but it's a strategic use of principally what and how questions, and he did the first one. We now refer to it as a time travel question. When you want to move someone's perspective either forward or backward in time, 
and make them look at something and confront them without them feeling confronted. A bad guy, and while he researched the ransom, he wanted a daily amount of money to be paid to keep the hostage alive. And it was a reasonable amount, and it was a brilliant way to bleed the family for years, potentially. And so we started to negotiate whether or not we we're going to pay the daily amount, which mom wanted to pay, by the way. Mom's son is going to get his head cut off, and it's only going to cost her $200 a day to keep him alive. She's happy to put that up. But we thought it would drain the family. So on his own, the guy I'm coaching said, he used the win-what combination. He said, when we run out of money paying this, what's going to happen? Time travel combination of the win-what. You know, and the kidnapper on the other side hesitates. And he says, it'll be all right. Now, my negotiators because I'm running this thing from Washington, D.C. They called me on the phone an hour, hour and a half after this, and they said, this is what was just said. And I literally, I start doing a happy dance. I start jumping up and down. I go like, holy cow, holy cow. And they go, what? They go, what? I said, we got him. He just promised not to kill our hostage. He doesn't know he said that. It was an unconscious response. But when he said, it'll be all right, he promised not to harm our guy. We got even more of an advantage now than this guy has any idea. We continued to push the negotiation. And in about five days after that conversation, the Philippine National Police identified a location he was in and swooped in and rescued our hostage. And that's when we found out that we were dealing with a guy who killed kid people in the past. He'd done multiple kidnappings. He did a kidnapping where he cut somebody's ear off. I knew about the kidnapping. I didn't know it was this guy. And we got our hostage out. Wow. If you read Never Split the Difference, negotiating as if your life depended on it, for the hostage stories, you get your money's worth. If you read it for the practical applications of communications, you get your money's worth. If you read it for the philosophy on the beauty of conflict, you get your money's worth. Chris, if you put all three together, I mean, I'm a huge, unapologetic fan of the book. It's required reading for anyone at 1% better. Thank you. Thank you very much. My final question, Chris, for you before we send people to where they can find more of your work. My final question is a lot of this. We talked about 73855. Um, a lot of it's it's beautiful in person. Uh, how does it work in email or text? Um, it works if you cut it if you cut it down. Um, the, the best lesson I teach people is like, would if you were playing chess via email, would you give the other side your next seven moves in one email? <laughs> No, no, sir. Yeah, that's what most people do in emails. They, they, they put their next seven moves out there, and that's why it goes sideways. Cut it down into smaller bits. Go overboard putting nice phrases in. To so I refer to them as softeners. I use I'm sorry and I'm afraid an awful lot in, in, when I'm delivering bad news. And then the critical piece is if you have anything whatsoever at all, anything, to say in the email, instead of opening your email with it, put it last. Because the last impression is the lasting impression, and that's what will ring in their ears. Mm, it's, it's so good, Chris. It's, it's just great stuff that's actionable and people can put into practice. Where, where can we send people in droves to kind of to get more of Chris Voss? Uh, you know, the best avenue to everything that we do is the uh, the weekly negotiation advisory newsletter we put out. It's complimentary. It's, that means free. I had a colleague that always loved to say, if it's free, I'll take three. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's short, digestible articles. I mean, they're easy to read. You can sit down and you can, about 500 words, which is about a page, page and a half max, once a week comes out on Tuesdays, also tells you about where we're training, also tells you about different uh, negotiation ways, products we have that can help you. The name of the newsletter is The Edge. And if you text, send a text to the number 22828, that's 22828, and you text the word FBI empathy with no space. Don't let your, don't let your autocorrect, you know, put in a space between FBI and empathy, but FBI empathy, all one word to 22828, and it'll, you'll get a response back to sign up for the newsletter. Mm. 
Chris, is, it's phenomenal. Uh, at the end of every episode, I want to make sure that, that we delivered things that people can improve today. Very difficult to imagine someone listening to this and, and not improving. So I just thank you. Sincerely, thank you for spending some time with us. Absolutely my pleasure. Thank you for having me on.